It was a brisk fall morning in Boston, and students at the prestigious Crestwell Institute filed into room 207, known for housing Professor Harper's infamous mathematical combat class. It was the toughest math elective in the entire state, reserved for top-tier minds, where students often cracked under the pressure of one of Harper's signature blackboard challenges. Professor Harper was brilliant, but he had a sharp tongue and little patience for what he called mediocrity in disguise. So, when a soft-spoken woman entered the room by mistake, the professor didn't even try to hide his irritation. She wore a plain sweater, jeans a little too worn, and sneakers that had clearly weathered more than a few seasons. She clutched a small notebook, looking lost. This isn't the public library, Harper said dryly. Who are you? I'm Anna. I was told there's an open guest lecture. I just wanted to sit in, if that's all right, she said, glancing around nervously. The students chuckled, some snickering at her appearance. She looks like someone's mom who got lost on the way to the grocery store, one whispered. Professor Harper raised an eyebrow. Very well, if you're brave enough to sit in, you can stay, provided you don't interrupt. Anna quietly took a seat in the last row. The lecture began. Harper launched into advanced calculus proofs, sprinkling his usual sarcasm throughout. After forty minutes, he turned to the board and wrote a monstrous equation, one that even his brightest students hesitated to approach. This, he said, tapping the chalk, has stumped three Ivy League grad students and half this room. Anyone here willing to try? The silence was deafening. Then, as if moved by instinct rather than bravado, Anna raised her hand. Gasps echoed through the classroom. Harper looked amused. You, this equation isn't from a GED booklet. It's doctoral-level theoretical math. Anna stood up anyway. All right, then, Harper said, stepping aside with a smirk. Be my guest. She approached the board. Her hands trembled at first, but as the chalk touched the surface, something shifted. Her posture straightened, her eyes focused. The room fell dead silent as she moved through the complex variables with stunning precision. First left to right, then up, then a sequence no one had ever considered. It was like watching a dancer remember an old routine, awkward at first, then utterly graceful. Within ten minutes, she placed the chalk down. I believe that's your solution, she said softly. Harper's face was frozen. He walked to the board and traced her steps line by line. His expression changed, first confusion, then disbelief, and finally, respect. You, you actually solved it, he muttered. That's correct. The students were stunned. Who are you? One of them finally blurted out. I used to teach math, she replied, a long time ago. Where? Harper asked, still recovering. Princeton. She said, eyes down. But I left before finishing my PhD. Life got in the way. Why haven't I heard of you? He asked incredulously. Anna shrugged. Because I've spent the last ten years working night shifts at a diner and helping raise my siblings. I still do math, but mostly in notebooks between serving tables. The room fell into a reverent silence. Professor Harper finally spoke. Stay after class. We need to talk. And for the first time in a long while, Anna smiled. Not because someone praised her, but because after all these years, someone recognized her. When the last of the students left room 207, Professor Harper closed the door behind them. The fluorescent lights buzzed softly overhead as he turned back to Anna, still standing near the chalkboard where her solution remained untouched. A proof so elegant it might have earned applause at a mathematical symposium. I meant what I said. He began walking closer. That solution wasn't just accurate, it was brilliant. You simplified a method that experts have been circling around for years. Anna offered a modest smile. I just saw a pattern in the chaos. Harper studied her face for a moment. Why did you really stop? No one with your mind walks away from a field like mathematics without a reason. Anna hesitated, then sat down in the front row. My father passed away during my final year at Princeton. My younger siblings were still in school. I couldn't leave them with nothing. So I took on whatever work I could. Waitressing gave me flexible hours. Harper folded his arms, silent for a beat. Still, 
for you to hide away for ten years while the world missed out on this, he gestured to the board. It's almost criminal. I didn't hide, Anna replied, a touch defensive. I survived. I still did math every day, on receipts, napkins, old journals. I just never thought I'd be taken seriously again. Professor Harper moved to his desk and retrieved a sleek leather folder. I have connections at the Mathematical Society of America. If you're willing, I can get your work reviewed. I know at least three universities that would fight over the chance to bring you in as a research fellow. Anna's eyes widened. You'd really do that for me? You already proved yourself. I'm just opening the door you were wrongly kept from. It wasn't long before word of the mysterious guest from Room 207 began spreading like wildfire. A viral video, recorded secretly by a student, showed Anna solving the equation with poise and brilliance. Within days, it had racked up millions of views, sparking hashtags like Ja Hidden Genius and Ja Diner to Doctorate. Journalists came knocking. A local news crew interviewed her at the diner where she still worked the night shift. We were just joking that she always scribbled on napkins, her manager laughed. Turns out we had a genius in the back booth all along. Within a week, Anna was invited to speak at a STEM conference in New York. Harper accompanied her. When she walked onto the stage, wearing the same plain sweater, though freshly washed, the applause was thunderous. She opened her talk with a gentle smile. People often confuse simplicity with lack of intelligence, she said, but sometimes quiet minds carry the loudest ideas. Universities extended fellowship offers, tech companies sent emails, but Anna chose to return to Princeton to finish what she started. Months later, she stood again at a chalkboard, this time as an official guest lecturer at her alma mater. In the front row sat a group of young women, eyes wide, notebooks ready. And that, she said, completing another elegant proof, is what happens when you believe in your own voice even when the world forgets to listen. After the class ended, a student approached her nervously. Do you think someone like me could ever be good at this? I've never been the best. Anna smiled. You don't need to be the best. You just need to love it enough not to quit. And just like that, a woman who'd been mocked, underestimated and forgotten became something more than just a mathematical genius. She became a symbol of resilience, quiet strength, and the power of hidden brilliance waiting to shine.